Without any uh, further delay, I'd like to introduce the first speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Ann Davidson, who will tell us uh, her topic is Meet the Monocytes, New Experiments Shed Light on the Potential Role of Immune Cells Called Monocytes in Lupus Nephritis. So Dr. Davidson's from Australia. She received her medical surgical degree from the University of Melbourne, and good eye, and uh, <laughs> that's, as, that's as good as I can do. And she's a board certified rheumatologist. And as an academic researcher, she's held positions at Albert Einstein Medical College, Columbia University, and then in 2010, she moved to Long Island, where she uh, is a professor of molecular medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and an investigator at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research. Uh, Dr. Davidson is the recipient of the Dubois and the Distinguished Basic Science Investigator Award from the American College of Rheumatology. She's a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians and Surgeons, and she's currently a member of the National Institute of Arth Arthritis Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases Board of Scientific Counselors. And these are individuals who review the internal programs at that institute of NIH, so it's a very uh, prestigious position. So uh, Dr. Davidson's work has been uh, focused on the pathogenesis and therapy of SLE and other rheumatic diseases. One goal is to understand the regulation of uh, autoantibody producing B cells, how cells localized to the kidney, but also uh, her work goes from basic to translational studies, uh, including uh, clinical trials, the efficacy and mechanism of new biologic agents, recent papers on blocking uh, different co-stimulatory molecules in a, a mouse model of RA, and also anti-BAF antibody, which was mentioned earlier, it's a B cell growth factor uh, in inflammatory myositis in a, in a more clinical setting. So Dr. Davidson, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, so I also want to thank the organizers for this invitation and also to Genevieve for reminding us that the patient is at the forefront of everything that we do and everything that we think about. So today I'm going to uh, walk you through some studies um, that have really been a team science effort, uh, starting with some studies from my lab in mice and then moving on to the human studies. So this is a summary of what I'm going to tell you. And what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is lupus, but specifically uh, kidney inflammation in lupus or lupus nephritis. So lupus nephritis is really a problem in lupus patients. It affects many of our lupus patients. Uh, it's very difficult to get these patients into remission, even in the setting of clinical trials. And about 5 to 10% of our patients go into renal failure requiring dialysis or transplant within five years of onset of this disease. It's an unpredictable disease with um, uh, unpredictable course and unpredictable response to therapy and most trials of biologic agents have failed. We only have one biologic agent so far for this um, complication. So what are the problems with thinking about lupus nephritis? Firstly, uh, the way we classify it doesn't really reflect the heterogeneity of this disease. Second, the kidneys are very complex microenvironment, so difficult to deal with uh, experimentally. Um, there are immune mechanisms, obviously, that, that start this disease, but then there are many non-immune mechanisms that complicate uh, the course and contribute to damage. Uh, it's very difficult to get access to human tissues. Most people will have a biopsy, but only once. Uh, we, we rarely repeat biopsies. And so to try and figure out what's going on in each patient individually has been very difficult and therefore been difficult to target therapies. So just to show you uh, uh, the environment of the kidney, so starting at the, at the top left, you see a nephron here, and here is the glomerulus here, and if we blow it up, you can see that it uh, consists of uh, a vascular space as well as a urine space, 
and there are lots of specialized cells in these areas. In lupus, the immune complexes shown in yellow can deposit on this side of the basement membrane or on the other side of the basement membrane, or they can deposit in the uh, interstitial spaces known as the mesangium. And this is just a blow up of this, uh, um, what we call the glomerular filtration apparatus, which has the endothelial cells on this side, that's here, and the podocytes in the urinary space on the other side. These are joined by these things called slit diaphragms, and when these get disrupted, the patients develop proteinuria. So we have to remember that 90% of the kidney is not glomeruli, it's tubules and interstitium. And here, um, the, there are lots of cells that can infiltrate here, including uh, immune cells. Uh, and eventually, uh, this is where fibrosis will occur. So we know that if you have an episode of lupus nephritis shown here, that uh, glomeruli will start to drop out. So in the normal situation, you have a certain number of glomeruli. As you age, they drop out, and most people will outlive their glomeruli, so we won't go into renal failure. But if you have an episode of lupus, you may lose some, and then you may eventually uh, lose enough of them that uh, renal replacement is required. And if the nephritis is ongoing, then that will happen sooner rather than later. The other thing that's known about this is that if there are lots of immune cells in the kidney biopsy, that this will um, result in a worse prognosis. So in this study, they divided patients into quartiles depending on how many immune cells were in the interstitium of the biopsy. And if there were a lot of immune cells, that's this fourth quartile, these patients had a very poor prognosis. So immune cells um, seem to be associated with poor outcome. Okay, so one of the other things that's different about the kidney than other organs is the blood supply. So when the blood comes into the glomerulus, it circulates. When it comes out of the glomerulus, all of the blood supply to the interstitium is from this runoff from the glomerulus. So if the glomeruli are damaged, if there's glomerular hypertension, if there are less glomeruli, there is less blood supply coming to the interstitium, and therefore this area is very prone to hypoxia. And in our patients, there are lots of other things that will uh, give them an increased risk for hypoxia, including hypertension and atherosclerosis, anemia, um, if they've had previous episodes. And so these patients are prone to renal hypoxia. And normally, if you have hypoxia in a short-lived fashion, you'll have protective mechanisms that come on to protect the capillaries that are in here, um, HIF-alpha, uh, various uh, things that will break down fibrosis and antioxidants. But if the hypoxia becomes chronic, this becomes dysregulated. So now VEGF will go down, HIF-1-alpha will uh, go down, there'll be apoptosis of epithelial cells, recruitment of fibroblasts, recruitment of inflammatory and immune cells, and, um, and then this will result in fibrosis. So lots of things will contribute to this. So there are genetic factors. Uh, I think we're going to talk about African-Americans a little later. Um, so these can um, influence the severity and the progression of renal damage. Um, if you have multiple insults over a long period of time, this can result in progression. Um, sometimes patients are in remission, but histologically, if you biopsy, they look awful. And so we might be missing ongoing grumbling disease and not treating it properly. Um, we don't have any biomarkers that we can use in clinical practice. And then, of course, we have a whole problem in the United States with delayed diagnosis, no access to healthcare providers, no access to lupus specialists, uh, uh, difficult to, to buy and to take medications, and these also have, also have an impact on outcomes. So now let's move to the science. So what have we learned from the mouse models? So why do we need mouse models, right? So the human biopsies are very hard to come by, and they're not representative of the whole organ. We biopsy the cortex and not the rest of the kidney. We don't repeat them, and usually we've treated them with steroids and all kinds of things before we do the biopsy. So they're, they're not as representative as we would like. 
the mice, we do have heterogeneous mouse models. We can control for disease stage. We can control for treatment. We can do mechanistic studies and we can test interventions. So the mouse models are still useful. So I'm going to walk you through an old experiment that we did a number of years ago where we followed uh, one mouse model. This is the NZBW mouse that was mentioned earlier. And we took out kidneys at various stages of disease, starting before the nephritis and then uh, going through uh, older mice NP means they weren't proteinuric. So they still weren't sick. So they're getting older, weren't sick, getting older, weren't sick. And then we had ones that got sick early, these ones here. And then we waited and all the rest of them got sick. And we did uh, gene expression analyses. And what we saw was that changes in gene expression happened when the mice got sick. So having proteinuria was actually a nice biomarker for what was going on in the kidney. So we had 1300 genes change their expression pattern in these two mice match for age, but these were not proteinuric and these were. And then we had very little gene changes happening as the mice aged, but again, as they moved from non-proteinuric to proteinuric, we had changes in gene expression. And we went on to induce remission in these mice. Again, a very complicated set of experiments, but basically what we could see if we just focus here, if we took these proteinuric mice and we put them in remission with drugs, we turned off uh, a whole lot of genes. So this change in gene expression happened at the onset of proteinuria, and we could turn it off again when we induced remission. And we saw several patterns of expression of these kinds of genes. There were genes that went up when the mice got sick, came down when we put them in remission. But then as the mice were progressing, they weren't proteinuric yet, they went back up again. So these were kind of early markers of disease. And then we had genes that changed with uh, proteinuria. And despite the fact we put them in remission, they didn't go away again. So there were some things that were fixed after this episode of proteinuria. And one of them I want to point out is a decrease in VEGF, which maintains capillaries. So it suggested that there was going to be an endothelial uh, problem uh, in mice that it had uh, an episode. And then we had genes that went up uh, with proteinuria, came down with remission, and just stayed down. And these were genes that were kind of what we termed the kind of terminal problems of an episode of nephritis. These tended to be tubular epithelial cells, uh, cell expressed genes that reflected damage, terminal damage to the tubular epithelium. OK, so then we did uh, uh, analysis of all the changes in gene expression. And we identified two clusters of genes. So this first cluster went up when the mice got sick. And this cluster uh, was a cluster that went down. And so let's just focus on this cluster one. These are genes that went up when the mice got sick. So here you see mice that are aging. Then here they got sick. Here they were sick for longer. And then here's remission, they all went down again. And then they kind of oodled along a little bit, were starting to come back as the mice were getting sick again. So what were these genes? These were inflammatory genes. So if we look at uh, two different mouse models of nephritis, we see here, this, these are young mice on the top. These are a whole lot of inflammatory genes that we measured by PCR. And what you can see is, as the mice developed their proteinuria, a lot of these went up. And when we put them in remission, they went away again. This is what we do in our patients. We give them immunosuppressives. We get rid of these inflammatory genes. Second mouse strain behaved exactly the same way. This one's a bit slow to change. OK, so what was in cluster two? These are genes that went down as the mice got sick. So here they are. Here are the mice. They're young. They look fine. They're getting older. They look fine. They get sick. These go down. They get sicker, they go down even more. We put them in remission, they come back up again. But then as they're heading towards their relapse, they haven't relapsed yet, they go back down. So what were these? These were genes that were involved in metabolic pathways and mitochondrial dysfunction. So if we look at these, you see you start out with good levels of these genes, again, done by um, 
uh, PCR. And then as the mice age, it doesn't look too bad, but at the onset of proteinuria, they go down and they stay down in the sick mice. If we put them in remission, they come back up, but they go back down again pretty quickly, even before the mice get sick again. So these are mice still in remission, but they're going to relapse soon. And when we looked at transcription factors that might regulate these genes, we identified PPAR gamma C1A as a key transcription factor. So this is a transcription factor that directs mitochondrial functions. And this was exciting because around the same time, uh, Catlin Sustak's lab identified both in mice and humans with different diseases that PPAR gamma C1A was an important mediator of, uh, of tubular epithelial damage in kidney um, diseases. And she then did the experiment where she took uh, mice and she induced kidney disease. And since then, she's identified a number of transcriptional regulators of fatty acid oxidation. So tubular epithelial cells depend on fatty acid oxidation for their energy. So these are transcription factors that regulate that. And if there is not enough energy in these cells, basically they de-differentiate. And so, and this is uh, identified by their upregulation of a very good biomarker called KIM1. So she did a very simple thing. She overexpressed PPAR gamma C1A in, uh, in kidneys and induced an acute renal injury. And when she did this, she protected these renal tubular cells pretty much completely. There was no KIM1 in these, uh, in these being released by these cells. And in addition, very importantly, the collagen genes uh, measure of renal fibrosis were not upregulated. So she was able to prevent uh, renal fibrosis by overexpressing this PPAC gamma C1A. Okay, so just a summary for this part, uh, what we found is that there's a really significant shift in gene expression which occurs at proteinuria onset. And renal inflammation occurs first, followed by mitochondrial dysfunction, metabolic stress. Um, and uh, I, I didn't have time to show you this, also very interesting, a circadian rhythm disturbance in the kidney. And then when we induce remission, we can reverse the inflammatory changes but the progression to, towards relapse is associated with this mitochondrial dysfunction and metabolic stress, even before there's proteinuria. And then the pathways associated with terminal loss of renal function are this capillary um, uh, dropout, tissue remodeling, and tubular damage. And this is what can be prevented by PGC1-alpha overexpression. So you can imagine that because of this, it's much easier to prevent renal disease than to induce a remission and prevent fibrosis. So this is a lesson for our patients. We need to get them all much earlier. Okay, we also found at this time that the molecular markers overlap very well with those that were expressed in human lupus kidneys. So now how are we going to translate this to human studies? And I'm going to focus today just on the human renal macrophages because there are so many cells to talk about. I can't talk about all of them. And uh, uh, around this time, we were getting a little uh, stuck because we didn't have human tissues. And the NIH funded a very large program called the Accelerating Medicines Partnerships that we were fortunate to become a part of. And this is a real team science effort to take human <coughs> renal biopsies from lupus patients and to try and understand from cellular and single cell studies what is going on in those tissues. Okay, so, uh, so just before I talk about the humans, I just wanna show you uh, five different models of lupus nephritis, all of which are different from each other. And for the aficionados, all the different things about them are down here. Um, so just to say that two of these models, this one and this one, have a double dose of toll-like receptor 7. So they have a Y chromosome abnormality in which part of TLR7 ended up on the Y chromosome. So it's actually the males that get sick 
uh, in these two strains. And these are the ones we've heard about already, MRLLPR, NCBW, uh, and these ones have B and T cell activation, get a lot of renal inflammation. So we had done an experiment where we looked at um, uh, the three of these uh, strains just by gene expression uh, during uh, their onset of lupus nephritis to see what was similar between the three strains that were shared with human kidney biopsies. And what we found was that all three strains shared a set of genes that were associated with macrophage activation. And they shared other things as well, but, but this was kind of a striking signature. So uh, we became interested in this because there was human data, it was rather old, uh, from uh, pathology papers, old pathology papers, showing that if you took renal biopsies from human lupus nephritis patients, and if you looked at them, if they had no macrophages in their, in their biopsies, they did pretty well. But if they had a lot of infiltrates, they didn't do so well. So macrophage infiltrates were associated with a worse prognosis. And here's a little bit of a later study looking at fibrosis score and the number of macrophages in the renal biopsy. And you can see that macrophages are associated with more fibrosis. So we started to ask ourselves, well, what kind of macrophages are in there? And long story short, we eventually got to single cell studies. And we did our single cell studies in four different mouse strains. So the two that have the toll-like re receptor 7 overexpression, so more of an innate activation leading to their lupus, and the ones that have expanded lymphoid cells leading to their lupus. And we took the kidneys and harvested them, dissociated them, did single-cell RNA-seq, and the four strains are shown here in these four sets of boxes. And we looked what kind of myeloid cells were in the kidneys. So we identified all these subsets of myeloid cells up here, and I'm only going to tell you about macrophages, so these five subsets here. And out of those five subsets, I'm going to focus on two of them. So we found, uh, firstly, non-classical macrophages, so these are LY6C low in the mice. We found two subsets of them. And when we looked to see where they were localized, this is actually a human biopsy, it's the same in the mice they were localized in the glomeruli. And you can see they're not out in the interstitium at all. Um, and then we then identified two subsets of classical macrophages that's shown here, and we identified resident macrophages. And this is the UMAP of these, and you can see the macrophage subsets here. And all four uh, mice were quite similar to each other in the canonical genes that they expressed. So I'm going to talk about these two subsets here. OK, so this is where our collaboration with the Accelerating Medicines Partnership came into play. And this was a collaboration between the NIH and the Foundation for the NIH and Pharma. So these are all the pharma supporters. These were the network sites, the PIs of the network sites. It was a very large project. And, um, and there was a clinical component as well as a basic science component. And we enrolled patients, more than 18, who had lupus, who had an indication for a biopsy, who had a UPCR urine protein creatinine ratio of greater than 0.5 and had some kind of lupus nephritis. And they were followed, they had their renal biopsy at baseline, and they were followed out for a year. It's not a clinical trial, so the patients were on all kinds of medications. And this is the pipeline for the, um, for the um, kidney biopsies. So the patients gave blood, the kidney biopsies were taken, there was single cell RNA-seq on 155 lupus nephritis biopsies, 30 healthy controls, and single nuclear RNA-seq was done on 40 and 10. I'm not going to show you any of the single nuclear RNA-seq data. Clinical data was collected and then the patients were identified if they went into complete remission, partial remission, or non-remission, and our data was the same as Everyone else's less than 50% of the patients went into remission. OK, so now, what we then did was to look to see how our mice compared with what was going on in the humans. So we took our four different mice that we had done the single cell RNA-seq. We made a composite UMAP out of those four different uh, mice strains. And we compared these four different mice 
to 155 lupus nephritis biopsies. And what we could see is that we were able to identify exactly the same subsets of myeloid cells in the human biopsies as we could identify in the mice. And again, I'm focusing today on these two subsets, the classical twos and the resident, which were also present in the humans. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm focusing on these cells is that when we take this UMAP, so this is a much more detailed UMAP of the human myeloid cells. I've turned it on its side, so it kind of lines up here. So the classical twos are here, the resident cells are down here. So what we found was that by using this tool called covarying neighborhood analysis, which allows you to see by unbiased clustering uh, which cells associate with particular clinical uh, phenomena that were me measured during the AMP studies, is that if we looked at activity index, a histologic measure of how severe the active inflammation is in the lupus biopsy, and red means positively associated and blue means negatively associated, that there was a positive association of the activity index with C2 uh, macrophages. But then when we look at chronicity index, which is a measure of more established changes, fibrosis, tubular changes, endothelial changes, what we could see then was that only a subset of these C2s were associated and now we're seeing an association between this chronicity index and resident macrophages. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the resident macrophages first. These are highly specialized cells. This is a, a reporter showing where they are. So these are renal tubules, and you can see the resident macrophages decorating these tubules. And the endothelium is kind of in the middle here. So if you're staying for endothelium, again, you see these resident macrophages all in the endothelium, between the endothelium and the tubules. And if you do um, EM, and this blue thing is a macrophage, and the pink thing is an uh, endothelial cell, you can see the macrophages in the endothelial cells are really closely associated with each other with no basement membrane in between whereas the tubular cells are separated from the macrophages by a basement membrane shown here in yellow. And because of this um, uh, anatomic uh, peculiarity, kidney uh, macrophages can eat small immune complexes that come in through the blood. So if you inject small immune complexes in the blood, um, they will immediately, within one minute, be eaten by these macrophages. So these behave very similarly to Kupfer cells in the liver. They'll just eat these little immune complexes. So they're easily activated um, uh, in the kidney. Okay, so uh, is this clinically important? So the question that was asked by the AMP, and this was work that was done at Johns Hopkins by Andrea Fava, who's one of the AMP members, using proteomic analysis. So he took all the urines from these patients and he did proteomic analysis on them. And then he looked, he asked the question, is there a biomarker that's going to tell us if a patient is going to go in remission or not? Uh, because right now remission is really, we can't be sure that a patient's in remission for about 12 months. That's how long it takes. So he looked at the three month urines to see if he could tell a little earlier. And what he found was that going into remission was associated with disappearance of a number of urine biomarkers shown here. And what was very interesting to us was that the classical two macrophage markers were very highly represented here. So here are some of them, CD206, CD163, galactin-1, cathepsin S, legumane. And so this suggested to us that disappearance of these classical two macrophages would be a very nice biomarker of someone that's going to go in remission. And when he did the AUC curves shown in, um, in red and orange here, it outperformed proteinuria as a biomarker of remission. So that was kind of nice. So I want to spend just a couple minutes on the epithelium because we know that epithelial injury is a terminal problem 
in uh, the mice with nephritis. <coughs> and so we've become very interested also in understanding what's going on in the epithelium. So, um, so renal epithelium reconstitutes itself very well. So if someone goes into acute renal failure because they become very dehydrated for some reason or something like that, the tubules will regenerate. So the patient might need dialysis for a few weeks, but then the tubules will regenerate. So here's the, uh, the tubule that will de-differentiate, uh, the capillaries will um, will be uh, damaged, but then they'll recover, the tubules will regenerate. But if this goes on for too long, then there is failed differentiation and this process called maladaptive repair. And then there's immune um, uh, mediators get released, then the capillaries drop out, you have hypoxia and you end up with fibrosis. So what was happening in our lupus patients? So these, this is just um, uh, a map of um, several different uh, clusters of tubules that were found in our lupus patients. And what we could see was that these ones in blue were abnormal and they were found in the lupus patients. So what was interesting about these is that they had downregulated this set of genes here, which is a set of metabolic genes here. And they had upregulated this set of genes here, which is a known signature um, that actually corresponds pretty well to the mouse signature of maladaptive tubular repair. So we were seeing this dysregulated repair and dysregulated metabolic processes in, in the humans. And this is just showing by, uh, again, covariating neighborhood analysis, the associations of this repairing signature. So this is proximal tubules, loop of Henle and distal tubules. And in each case, there was a correlation of this maladaptive repair with chronicity uh, by pathology on the biopsy. So these are all the repairing cells, repairing and down here, repairing cells. So um, I'm going to show you the therapeutic um, implications of this in just one second. So, but before I get to that, just the conclusions from this uh, section, we can see that the kidneys of our nephritis patients contain multiple macrophage subsets. The classical two cells are not found either in the blood or in healthy kidneys. They appear to differentiate upon renal entry and they have this damage associated phenotype. And the resident macrophages also change their phenotype to a more damage associated phenotype during disease activity and chronicity. And these uh, macrophages release some biomarkers into the urine and the disappearance of these predicts remission. And so the similarities we found between mice and humans now are allowing us to start functional studies in the mice, things we just cannot do um, in humans. So therapeutic approaches, what does this give us? This gives us new opportunities for intervention. So clearly there are new immune targets, so maybe we can start to target the myeloid cell profibrotic programs and allow repair to occur or to target some of the infiltrating lymphocytes that I didn't show you today to protect the glomerulus. But we also want to protect the tubular epithelium and the renal vasculature from this maladaptive response to hypoxia. And again, I'm using data from Catlin Sustak's lab. It's, it's such a beautiful study, but it's very informative. So she has um, a model of ischemia reperfusion in which uh, a short period of ischemia allows repair, but a long period of ischemia results in fibrosis. So what she shows is that in these uh, fibrotic tissues, she's seeing this new subset of uh, renal tubular cells that reflect maladaptive repair. Shown here, and this is the signature of them. Uh, and again, this is just showing you this, this maladaptive uh, repair signature. So what she did was to use this for therapeutic discovery. And she took uh, this uh, signature and she put it into a pharmaceutical database of all drugs that will uh, alter gene expression uh, in the kidney. And so she looked to see which drugs would 
change this maladaptive signature. And she came up with two pathways that were interesting. One was pyroptosis pathway and one was ferroptosis pathway. And she even showed in her ischemic mice with fibrosis that ferroptosis was upregulated. So then she treated these mice with drugs that blocked either pyroptosis or ferroptosis. And what was interesting about this to me, this is her control uh, UMAP here, and this is her, um, her fibrotic kidney. And you can see all the myeloid cells in this fibrotic kidney. Uh, and what you could see also was this maladaptive repair signature in the fibrotic kidney. But if she treated these mice with drugs that inhibited either pyroptosis or ferroptosis, and I don't remember which drug is which, but they were both um, useful, she reversed this uh, fibrotic signature. So this was a pure gene discovery uh, experiment that ended up being very successful. And so one of the questions to us now is how this maladaptive tubular epithelium interacts with this myeloid cell signature to mediate the fibrotic program. So this is what we're currently uh, looking at. So um, there have been a lot of people in my lab that have been involved in these studies over the years, but this is a really team biology effort. We've had help from bioinformaticians at Mount Sinai and at University of Michigan. And actually these studies were first started together with Matthias Kretzler at University of Michigan. And then this is our small group at the Accelerating Medicines Partnership that's been working on the immune cells and um, uh, particularly want to thank Nirha Cohen and Paul Hoover who work with me on the myeloid cell studies and then the proteomics were done by Andrea uh, and Michelle Petrie. So I will leave it there.